Então, uh, eu gostaria de trabalhar a noite, obrigado, Douglas, obrigado para o convite. Uh, agora... Uh, <risos> inglês é uma língua difícil. Infelizmente, eu não falo português muito bem. Uh, então, é necessário que eu falo um, mas um, uh, eu fiz uh, uma tradução de muito boa, uh, mas eu acho que um, vai estar enganado com frequência. Eu sinto muito. So, agora eu vou mudar a inglês. So, um, I've been asked to, in this first lecture, give a fairly broad introduction to the subject of innate immunity, uh, which is a very large subject. And so we're only going to touch on the surface. And I'm going to try and uh, this will be a fairly simple lecture. It will hopefully put everybody on this in the same place. And so let me start by saying um, that uh, if you don't know it already, it is a dirty world out there. So it is inhabited with all sorts of microbes. We would like nothing more than to grow in your very rich uh, biological fluid, it's very good culture media. And so that has confronted multicellular organisms with the challenge of how they survive in the dirty world. And so here we see the hordes of microbes that would like to grow inside of you. They're stopped initially by the epithelium. But if they're able to scale these walls, then the body needs a way of recognizing this and defending against it. And that's the job of the innate immune system. So let me tell you, start by saying uh, a few things about general principles of innate immunity. So this is a form of immunity that's phylogenetically quite ancient. So we see this throughout the animal kingdom, through plants, um, uh, through you know, multiple multicellular organisms. In the, the organization of this, um, this is a form of immunity that's pre existing. So you don't need exposure um, to a, a microbe to have this form of immunity build up. It's already there, so it's pre existing. And when the microbes scale the epithelium and come in, this form of immunity is very rapidly engaged, turned on, and or recruited to the cell. Now, once it does battle, and hopefully you survive, then the system resets to the baseline. So there's no what we call immunological memory. You're, in general, no better off the next time you see the organism uh, than you were before. And what this form of immunity attempts to do is either to take care of the problem, sterilize it, um, or at least delay it or limit it. And one of the features that I'm not going to get into that some other speakers may be is that there's a lot of bidirectional interactions between the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system that are the cells cells. Okay. So in terms of this lecture, um, as I was saying initially, we really can't cover all of innate immunity. The subject is much too broad. But what I've decided to do here is to really explore innate immunity by discussing one of its important responses, which is inflammation. It's a very important response medically um, and biologically, but this will not cover all of innate immunity. So I was saying that uh, innate immunity is phylogenetically quite ancient. It also turns out that in terms of medical history, it's probably one of the oldest, if not the oldest, recognized medical condition. So we can go back about 5,000 years and find in the written record here, um, in, in Egyptian hieroglyphics, words that have been translated to mean inflammation. So shamanet and seraph here. So this was recognized by the ancient uh, civilizations. We don't actually know what they recognized as inflammation, but uh, that was first recorded in the first century AD by the Roman academician Cornelius Celsus. And he described the four cardinal signs of inflammation, which I know each and every one of you is intimately familiar with because we've all experienced this. So the inflammatory response is heat, redness, swelling, and pain. And we're going to want to understand how all of those uh, signs and symptoms develop. This is important because uh, 
this causes symptoms, it brings patients to the hospital, and as we will see, it causes disease. Now, for a long time in history, um, inflammation really was not understood. Um, the theories back in that time was that there were imbalances in the bodily humors. Uh, so if you were red, you had too much blood, you'd uh, bleed you to try and make you better. And to really understand what was going on mechanistically required a technological advance, which is something that's, I, I think, a theme in science continually. A lot of what we learn depends on technological advances. And the technological advance that was important for inflammation is shown here, and that is the development of the microscope. Okay. <laughs> so this slide actually shows a problem that confronted early microscopists. Because at the time that the microscope was developed, we didn't have the microtome, which is what we use now to make very thin tissue sections, so we could let light go through. And so with these early microscopes, the, the uh, microscopists couldn't look at something like a woolly mammoth region. Um, and so they had to look at tissues or samples that were translucent that would let light through. And so uh, back in the 1800s, um, there were three investigators, uh, first Rudolf Wagner, then Augustus uh, Waller, and then Julius Kohnheim. And this actually shows a picture from one of Kohnheim's preparations. He took a living frog and pinned out the tongue. The tongue in the frog is very, very thin, so it lets light through. And he was studying what was going on in this. And so this was an example of early intravital microscopy. We tend to think of that as a technique that has been done recently, like by folks like Dean von Andrian, but in fact it is quite old. And we don't have a video recording of what Kohlenheim and his investigators saw, uh, but this is what they described and what they would have seen. And so what we're looking here, we're going to see a little video here of a living tissue. And what you're going to see here is there's an arterial that's coursing here, and branching over here. There's a little electric that is charged an electric uh, shock that can cause some tissue injury, and we're going to see what happens. So look at the blood flow, fairly limited. We have the injury here. And very rapidly, you can see here these vessels are getting larger and the blood flow is increasing markedly. So that was vasodilation. That's the quickest thing that it's seen. And then um, as you follow this response, we'll see what the next events here. So this is a denule that's in the living tissue. So this is the vessel room in here. And these cells here are leukocytes, white cells. And we'll see what happens. So you see that these cells have fallen out of the laminar flow and they are rolling on the, the surface of the vessel, slowing down, and then some of them arrest. And this isn't a site of inflammation. And some of the ones that have arrested, you're going to see here, they're against the endothelium. And there goes a shape change. And it begins to squeeze itself between two endothelium and go out into the tissue. You can see one here in the tissue, another one that's going to go out. That's a process we call diapodesis. And so all of these events were actually described back in the 1800s. Um, and this led to what is really our modern definition of inflammation, which is a response uh, to injury of vascularized tissue that whereby fluid and leukocytes accumulate at the site that this is going on. So um, this is a little cartoon of the events. This is a blood vessel. Ordinarily, our defenses are circulating in the blood, so it's soluble proteins and leukocytes, and they're simply coursing through the bloodstream. However, in a site of inflammation, what we've seen is if you vasodilate, that increases blood flow, which is going to increase dramatically the amount of defenses that are delivered to the site where the vasculature is expanded. And then we've seen that these defenses begin to leave the vessel. We saw that for the leukocytes, and I'm going to show you that later that's true also of protein-rich fluid. And so what this response is doing is it's delivering the defenses, and what the defenses are going to attempt to do is either to destroy or contain to wall off the injurious agents. And then its job is to remove the casualties. So on the battlefield, a lot of cells die. We have to get rid of those if we're going to rebuild the tissue. 
And ultimately, this process of successful needs to repair the damage. And so this is really the purpose, the objective of the inflammatory response. So uh, we said early on that Cornelia Celsus described these four signs of inflammation. So what are the underlying mechanisms? And I think most of this is obvious. So the redness in heat is a consequence of the vasodilation. So we breathe a lot more blood in, it looks redder, and the site gets warmer the core temperature. Now, um, just to um, fix this in your mind, so do people know what the difference is between an arterial and a venule? So if you were to look under the microscope, how those two work? <laughs> so the difference, what defines it as an arterial is that it has muscle in the wall. So if you look down a microscope, this is how you can tell. And so uh, this is a, an arterial in living tissue. And this is under normal conditions. This is no inflammation. It's a blood flow. And you can see that the muscle begins to contract here, limiting blood flow, and then it expands. And so this really is a muscular organ, a muscular tissue. And ordinarily you have this, it will contract and expand. But in general, the muscle has some contraction at all times. And that means if it relaxes, you can bring a lot more uh, blood in. So that's the mechanism of redness and heat. In terms of swelling, uh, what's going on there? So I'm going to show you a little clip here of an experiment. Um, and the participants here, I've labeled them, so you, sometimes you can't tell the difference. Um, that's the rat, that's the human. So what's being done here is to inject a blue dye into the tail vein of the rat. And this dye is going to bind to serum albumin, one of your major proteins that's in the serum. The rat's been anesthetized, it's dreaming nice dreams, his back has been shaved. And here we're putting a little filter strip with some histamine, which is an inflammatory mediator. Put it on this side here. And on the other side, some saline, which is the control. And we're going to let the, the rat dream whatever rats dream about for a period of time. probably dreaming about queso. If you take this off, you can see the area under here has become blue, where on the other side it has not. And so what's happened here is this blue dye that is bound to the serum albumin has leaked out into the tissue. This is one of the prominent features of inflammation, and that leakage <coughs> of fluid gives you this swelling. So I want to talk a little bit about why these vessels actually this is important for delivering your soluble defenses, so why do they leak? And there are a couple of reasons for this. So one is, when you vasodilate, you're essentially opening the faucet, right? You're allowing a lot more fluid to go through. That increases the pressure in the vessel. And that's going to try and force things out. It's like you turn on a, a hose uh, to pull things to clear pores. So there's increased hydrostatic pressure. And in addition, a number of the mediators that are generated at a site of inflammation, and these are some of them, act on the endothelium, the lining cells of the vessel, and cause them to contract. And when they contract, the normal pipe junctions here, which keep this fluid inside, begin to separate. And so we have gaps and a lot of pressure, and that can push the fluid out. And so that's why these begin to leak protein-rich fluid. So what this response is trying to do is to deliver at a site where something has stimulated inflammation to leak protein-rich fluid, which is going to deliver the soluble innate defenses. So what I'd like to now talk about are what are some of the soluble innate defenses. There are a lot of them. We're going to focus on simply two. Uh, so these two are collectins and phycolins, which are quite simple, similar and briefly on